Hello and welcome to today's IVD Ready webinar by Platomics with the title An Ounce of Validation. My name is Kia Glaser. I'm a customer success manager at Platomics and I will guide you through today's webinar. Validation under IVDR represents a new challenge for many diagnostic labs. During today's webinar, we will outline its foundations and how labs can approach the validation of their diagnostic tests. Let's have a look at the agenda and our speakers. We will kick it off with an introduction to validation requirements for labs by Clara Pessy. Clara is head of performance evaluation at Platomics and oversees the development of our new NGS validation service for labs. We are sorry to announce that our guest speaker, Dr. Herbert Stecker, will not be joining us today due to unforeseen circumstances. Instead, Karin Schwenoha, Senior Expert Advisor at Platomics, will speak about the validation of in-house diagnostic devices with a focus on analytical performance. Last but not least, Andreas Oberleitner, Chief Regulatory Officer at Platomics, will present the new validation section of our Plato X IVD Assistant and do a short demonstration of our NGS validation service. Today's webinar is part of our IVD Ready webinar series, which take, takes place in parallel to the progressive rollout of the IVDR. If you're interested in our past webinars, you can find the link on our homepage and can watch them on demand. You can also register for Plato X IVD Assistant by typing in the chat window below or by sending an email to info at platomics.com. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can, you can enter them in the Q&A section. Due to time constraints, we might not be able to answer all of them during the webinar, but we will of course get back to you afterwards. Now, let's start with an introduction to the topic by Clara Pessy. Clara holds a master's degree in biotechnology and innovation and is an expert on performance evaluation and the IVDR. Clara, over to you. Thank you very much, Pia. Then let's start. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome from my side as well. I will start this webinar with an introduction, giving you an overview of the EVDR and ISO performance evaluation slash validation topic. We will go through their applicability requirement and key changes for laboratories. First, let's start with the EVDR applicability and see who is concerned. The EVDR has been developed first for three different entities. The first one are the manufacturers, then we have the supplier of EVDs, and then the health institution. Why the health institution? Because uh, some of them have um, in vitro diagnostic medical laboratory tests and laboratories. They would have product manufactured in-house, so in-house devices, also called LDT, laboratory developed test, and they are considered de facto manufacturers. This means that the EVDR would apply to those health institution diagnostic laboratories as well. There are several scenarios when it comes to the LDTs. We will go through a few of them. The first one is the easiest. The laboratory uses only CE EVDs, all within their scope as claimed by the manufacturer. Therefore, they would have a fully compliant CE EVD workflow and they are CE marked. Other scenarios could be that the laboratory uses uh, CE EVDs, but outside of the scope uh, of the manufacturer information. Or they could use research use only product combination of CE device and non CE devices or laboratory developed tests. All of those scenarios and other would lead the laboratory to have an in house in vitro diagnostic medical device and falls under the scope of the EVDR. So basically, laboratories have two options. Either they have a fully compliant C workflow and they are therefore required to perform verification activities as uh, they are used to be under the ISO, or they would have a laboratory developed test and then the Article 5.5 of the EVDR would apply. The Article 5.5 of the EVDR outlines specific requirements related to performance evaluation on in vitro medical diagnostic device to demonstrate the device safety and performance characteristics. The relevant general safety and performance requirements set out in Annex 1 therefore apply. For performance evaluation, the focus would be mainly on the Chapter 2, requirement regarding performance design and manufacturing. So what does it mean really? And how does that fit with the current ISO? 
let's say I am a laboratory and I am compliant with the ISO 15189. So I am already performing verification and validation activity. The EVDR stipulates that I need to do performance evaluation. Is that the same thing? Is it sufficient or do I need to do something more if I'm a laboratory? Well, for that, the MDCG 2023 guidance is quite clear. For in-house EVDs, the laboratory of the health institution should be in compliance with the standard EN ISO 15189 or with national provision, including national provision regarding accreditation, of course. Compliance with the standard EN ISO 15189 may be understood as uh, accreditation to the standard or other means of compliance. However, and this is the interesting part, as the manufacturing process of a device and the compliance to the relevant requirement of Annex 1 is not in the scope of the standard, compliance with EN ISO 15189 alone does not constitute an appropriate QMS for the manufacture of an in-house EVDs. So concretely speaking, verification and validation activities are included inside the performance evaluation as stated inside the EVDR, but they are not sufficiently covering all of the requirements. Performance evaluation is based on three pillars. We will in the next slide go into the detail of it, but the analytical performance, the clinical performance, and the scientific validity. And those are the manufacturer requirements to comply with EVDR performance evaluation. Please note that uh, there is an ISO, uh, ISO this uh, 5649, that is currently on a draft stage. It will be voted in three months, I think, uh, called Medical Laboratory Concepts and Specification for the Design, Development, Implementation, and Use of Laboratory Developed Tests. And this ISO aims to harmonize the manufacturer requirement from the EVDR with the laboratory uh, requirement that will be requested to be compliant with the EVDR. Under the EVDR, the performance evaluation as stated before has three pillars, the scientific validity, the analytical performance, and the clinical performance. The scientific validity is the association of an analyte with a clinical condition or a physiological state. Uh, the EVDR is quite clear regarding the way they would like the manufacturer and laboratories to demonstrate that. And the most common way would be a systematic literature search and assessment of that search. Two deliverable would be expected there. There would be the literature search protocol for the systematic literature search and the scientific validity reports. The analytical performance is the ability of a device to correctly detect or measure a particular analyte. So that would be genetical sensitivity, specificity, interferences, cross-reaction. The bare minimum list is inside the EVDR. Of course, if you have other analytical performance parameters that are applicable to your device, you shall include them in your analytical performance evaluation. And if some of them are not applicable, you could exclude them with a proper justification. The demonstration of the analytical performance uh, must use analytical performance study. This means using experiment with known grants designed according to the literature and the state of the arts. The deliverable there would be an analytical performance plan and an analytical performance report. The clinical performance are very similar. So this is the ability of a device to yield results that are correlated with a particular clinical condition or physiological or pathological process or state in accordance with the target population and intended user. So as parameter, you would have the diagnostic sensitivity, specificity, likelihood ratio, and so on. Again, a clinical performance shall be demonstrated mainly with a clinical performance study or experiment, but this time with clinical sample and the deliverable would be a clinical performance plan and a clinical performance report. On top of those <laughs> deliverable, uh, the EVDR states what we call the performance evaluation plan and the performance evaluation report, also called validation master plan and performance evaluation report in some ISOs. And those are umbrella documents uh, collecting and gathering the three other pillars. You would also have PMPF plan and PMPF report. PMPF stands for post-market performance follow-up, also called post-projection report in the ISO. And this is taking into consideration uh, performance and safety of the device after it has been produced or used in clinical routine. So what are the key changes from before and what is the impact for laboratories? The requirements are definitely strengthened for the performance evaluation of an LDT. They are way much more rigorous uh, than before, aiming to ensure 
reliability, accuracy, and clinical relevance of the diagnostic test. Compliance with this requirement uh, might involve to invest additional resources. Structure of the documentation is now clearly defined by the EVGR in terms of uh, what deliverable are expected, what is expected inside the deliverable, the deliverable sorry. Uh, they shall report fully the detail of the methodology, results, protocol, conclusion, consequences of the performance evaluation, because these documents are the evidence of the validity and reliability of your performance evaluation data. As seen before, a comprehensive performance study are expected uh, for analytical performance and clinical performance, and the depth of evidence demonstration has been increased. The level of evidence uh, shall be proportionate and appropriate. It depends on your intended purpose, your risk class, the outcome of your risk management, the state of the art. Many things has to be taken into consideration to have an appropriate level of evidence. And finally, the full life cycle of the product is taken into consideration. Validation is not the end of the performance evaluation. You now also have to monitor what happens once the device is on clinical routine use or placed on the market if you are a manufacturer and ensure uh, safety and performance of the device after it has been produced. So how can you ensure compliance and what are the resources you can use to help you uh, complete all of those requirements? Of course, first you would have the regulation, so in vitro diagnostic medical regulation, medical device regulation. Um, you would have common specification. This is a set of technical and or clinical uh, requirements for which no harmonized standards is available, or when an harmonized standard is available, it doesn't sufficiently cover the requirements. So the European Union has uh, several of them already available. One of them is uh, the one for the class D in vitro medical diagnostic in accordance with EVDR, but uh, many for clinical performance are available. You would have the standards, so those are mandatory requirements that must be met for compliance. So you have international standards like your ISO. You would also have the technical specification. They are uh, often used when there is an emerging technology where the consensus has not yet been completely achieved, but still there is an agreement. You would have all of the industry standards like CLSI for laboratories, for instance, IEEE for electronic, but also the national one, BSI for England, FDA for US, for instance, a lot of, of uh, requirements are explained inside those documents. Some devices are very widely established, but are not standardized. It, this means that for some technology, there is no standards available out there. In that case, you can always use guidelines. So the European Commission has a lot of guidelines. The Medical Device Coordination Group, also known as the MDCG, the International Medical Device Regulator Forum, EMDRF, is also very productive when it comes to practical guidelines. Notified body issues several of them. Of course, you would have your industry association, like the MECTEP Europe, professional organization, ASCP, for instance. The guidelines provide recommendations and suggestions. They are advisory in nature, and their point is to inform decision making. Standards, guidelines, all of those documents are best practice documents. On top of it, you could also definitely use peer-reviewed scientific literature, which could be evidence-based or expert consensus. So all of those resources uh, shall hopefully help you ensuring compliance and understand a little more how to fulfill all of the EVDR and ISO requirements. With that being said, uh, this is it for this introduction for my side. Thank you very much for listening and I will now hand it over to Pia. Thank you, Clara, for this overview on validation and how it impacts diagnostic laboratories. Karin will now speak about the validation of in-house in vitro diagnostic devices, focusing on analytical performance. Karin can look back on more than 20 years of experience as a biomedical scientist in different labs. She also worked as senior lecturer at the University of Applied Sciences in Salzburg, as well as product reviewer and auditor for a German notified body. Therefore, she is well aware of the challenges faced by labs performing validation for their diagnostic tests. And with that, I now hand over to you, Karin. Thank you very much, Pia, for this introduction. I will share my screen first. Okay, so yes, uh, as I told you, welcome from my side to, to our webinar. Today we are talking about validation of in-house devices. 
So laboratories play a crucial role in the diagnostic process and in monitoring the effect of therapies. For this reason, even a small number of errors in laboratory tests can have a significant impact on health and patient safety. So today's learning objective from this webinar is to outline the typical step of an in-house uh, in, in vitro diagnostic implementation. We are focusing on the analytical performance validation. The clinical performance is only subsidiary as the device is used per definition in a clinical environment and a set of IVDR requirements for manufacturers are not applicable to clinical laboratories. For example, the fully blown performance evaluation process according to Annex 13 of the IVDR. What is the why behind Article 5.5? Let's, uh, let's try me to, uh, let's, try me to explain to you. The in-house IVDs are needed to address special needs of patients that remain unmet by uh, CE marked IVDs, for example, essays for rare diseases. For the sake of clarity, health institutions will be required to justify the use of in-house in vitro diagnostics and explain how they are more beneficial than existing IVDs after 2028, regardless of the rarity or uniqueness of a disease or condition. An in-house IVD must be verified by demonstrating that it has clinical utility for the intended patient population, but it can be implemented quickly for emergency use. This is an important advantage when the test must be developed and deployed in response to an emergency like an epidemic or a pandemic. The need for an in-house IVD is justified play, uh, based on clinical input to improve patient care. Input from a clinical advocate is thus key, uh, key in the assay development process. The laboratory that develops the assay must be knowledgeable about how the test will be used and understand the specimen type, range of detection, turnaround time requirements, and potential complementary tests. The regulatory basis for the, uh, for, for the manufacture of in-house devices is, of course, Article 5.5 of the IVDR. As Clara also mentioned before, is another important guidance document, the MDCG 2023-1. In the chapters 3.8 and 3.9 of the MDCG document is primarily about uh, showing and documenting that both the analytical and the clinical performance support the intended purpose of the product. A core statement of Article 5.5 describes that in-house products must fulfill the GSPRs. In fact, this is not possible without performance evaluation and risk management. Health institutions are not required, but may use standards or common specifications to demonstrate conformity with the, with the corresponding GSPR. And as Clara also mentioned before, the International Standardization Organization is currently working on a new standard pertaining in-house IVDs, so the ISO 5649. So uh, this document or this standard may be considered once it is a way label. So there are some key parameters that uh, should be addressed. So, and all these results of the analytical performance studies must be documented. So this slide shows some uh, key parameters that uh, uh, I'm sure that you know all these parameters well enough. Once the testing procedure is optimized, the test must be analytically validated according to requirements. This includes requirements for accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, reproduci reproducibility, and other parameters that will depend on the sample source and technology involved. As a general rule, the analytical performance shall always be demonstrated on the bias uh, on the basis of analytical performance studies. 
This was also mentioned by Clara. For novel markers or other markers without available certified reference material or reference measurement procedures, it may not be possible to demonstrate trueness. Analytical validation could be based also on published clinical literature or, for example, and on CLSI criteria. Very well, uh, very, very important is also the, do the documentation of all these steps. And here you can see the analytical, uh, the, the performance evaluation uh, circle, as Clara mentioned, the three pillars, clinical performance, scientific validity, and analytical performance. So let's focus on the uh, in-house IVD validation. It's all about validating the analytical performance of your test. When you are developing an in-house IVD, you should ask yourself a few questions in advance, which then have to be checked during the analytical performance validation. For example, which parameters should be detected with the test? What is my expected measuring range? Which sample material will be used? Will this be serum, plasma, which kind of anticoagulants you can use? Then you should, uh, should consider what endogenous, like pregnancy or exogenous interfering substances, for example, uh, medications, could occur and how will be dealt with. What are the expected limits of the uh, detection or the limit of quantitations? What is the expected range of precision or accuracy? And all these uh, questions should be answered with the analytical performance report. So the development ste uh, steps, so in, in laboratory, a development process, the document standards operating procedures for the essay and the, uh, includes the basic analytical validation uh, studies to show that the essay uh, satisfies clinical requirements. Validation often follow guidance from the clinical and laboratory standard institute, the st CLSI documents and other competent <clears throat> sources to demonstrate state of the art. Hand off from development to routine clinical testing should include a validation report that provides direction for the laboratory to verify their SOPs or validate modified SOPs. As a tip, here are a few questions you should ask yourself when or before developing an in-house IVD. Why run an in-house IVD? What is the test panel? Is the test set up properly and performing as, is, as expected? Are the tests results clinically accurate? What are the best practices for an in-house introduction? So you should think about these things before you start to develop a test. So regarding documents, sign and train, it's important that personnel who validate or verify in-house IVDs, uh, it should be trained and qualified to perform testing on patient specimen and have national licensure in countries where, where it is required. Once a test has, has been validated and the validation report is signed by the laboratory director, all technologists who may perform testing must be trained. And it's really important and also mentioned in ISO 15189 that competency must be assessed and documented in the QMS system before the technologist are qualified to perform the test, the new test on patient specimen. So a very important aspect of the validation is the competence of the user performing the analysis. This person must have sufficient knowledge of the methods used to be able to draw the right conclusions from the data obtained during validation. A few things about the document and declare, uh, declare to meet the requirements of Article 5.5. All testing procedures should be well documented and met, the, uh, and met the IVDR general safety and performance requirements as outlined in Annex 1 of the IVDR. SOPs for an in-house IVDR must be specific and updated regularly 
to meet international and institutional requirements. And the documentation must show that the SOP has been followed appropriately. The clinical laboratory must document all analytical validation and clinical utility studies, as well as the performance of assay controls within specified QC ranges. Uh, a few words to uh, regarding documentation. So it can, it could be that documentation is controlled by the national Com competent authority. The documentation required in Article 55.g uh, must allow the competent authority to understand the manufacturing process, the design and the performance data, and also the intended purpose of the in-house uh, in, in vitro diagnostic. The documentation must be sufficiently detailed to enable the competent authority to ascertain the general safety and performance requirements set out in Annex 1 of the IVDR. Changes and updates may necessitate retraining and respective documentation, as well as competency assign assessment of, for all testing personnel. So a word on the clinical verification. It is not stringent as the validation, but yet, uh, but yet helpful. Health institutions should gain and review experience from clinical use of all uh, of the in-house IVDs. All laboratories can use outside comparative studies to demonstrate the clinical utility of their in-house devices. These can be clinical utility studies, proficiency testing performed by certified vendors, or previous testing of repeat clinical samples. So, Clinical verification of an in-house IVD is less stringent than analytical performance validation. Also, this will depend on availability of specimen from patients with or without the disease of interest and the presence or absence of the target analyte in patient, sam uh, patient samples. This is a point which is depending on the disease you may, uh, you may analyze. So uh, the marker, or maybe if there is a, a very rare disease, you, you, uh, it will not be uh, uh, possible to have a lot of specimen for testing. And, and uh, yes, so you have to find a solution maybe in finding some clinical, uh, some scientific validity evidence to demonstrate the clinical performance. The conclusion of, uh, of this section for, for clinical laboratories de uh, developing and utilizing in-house IVDs, uh, it is important that they have an appropriate QMS and in-house IVDs that satisfy QMS requirements. It's really important to maintain training and competency documentation for all employees. All in-house IVDs validation studies must be document the accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, and reproducibility of testing when it is applicable. Evaluate and document analytical and, if necessary, clinical performance and the types of studies required are listed and noted in the IVDR. So every significant change, for example, a change of a component of a, of a supplier of raw material, uh, uh, changing in the manufacturing steps, the change of intended purpose requires a de novo validation. You should gain experience from the clinical use of all in-house IVDs. All laboratories can use outside comparative studies and so on. So this, you should use all the things that are available for you. It's our last slide. And it's, it, it says, if you do good validation, you have success and you, uh, you, you can gain patient safety. And as you working in the, in the lab, you know personnel from laboratories are committed to produce accurate test results. Only with an accurate test result, a correct diagnosis and a timely treatment is possible, thereby increasing patient safety and improving patient outcome. So thank you from my side.
and I will give back to Pia. Thank you, Karen, for this comprehensive overview of analytical performance during the validation of an in-house diagnostic test. Next, Andreas will showcase what Platomics offers for labs seeking support with their validation process, and he will demonstrate our new NGS validation service. Andreas, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon from my side. Thank you for the introduction. And I also would like to thank uh, um, Karin and also Clara to introduce us into the requirements and uh, um, additionally into the challenges laboratory are facing in uh, creating the documentation to be compliant with the IVDR in general, Article 5.5 requirements I'm addressing here, but especially the performance evaluation slash validation requirements. So we have talked a lot about the challenges and requirements themselves. Um, and I would like to uh, find a way together with you how to solve this or how to approach this. And uh, everyone who is already following us uh, for a longer time in the IVD Ready program knows that we are working on a software solution accompanying the whole process, uh, delivering a ton of features, ton of functionalities to support you in fulfilling those requirements or at least helping you in uh, creating uh, relevant documentation to be compliant with the requirements. Before I start uh, walking you through the tool and our latest uh, release, where we are really proud of, um, I would like to share also some insights, some slides with, with you to have a nice bridge here. Um, so just let me share my screen in a second. Okay, now you should be able to see my screen with the presentation with a few slides. Okay, so for everyone who uh, had not yet the chance to participate in our past webinars, I would like to spend a few words, only a few words on our platform itself. So we are talking about um, the play to x platform in general, which is connecting uh, multiple stakeholders to uh, facilitate data exchange and also to support uh, the work everyone needs to do to reach a certain level of compliance within the whole ecosystem of the IVDR. So our system uh, can be seen as a kind of a one-stop shop for the entire regulatory process. And I think this is the beautiful, beautiful thing here. Our system uh, can accompany your um, employees, your colleagues and yourself uh, for each and every step uh, along the red thread of the regulatory compliance from A to Z. And uh, via the IVD Ready program, um, we uh, go step by step uh, together and uh, help you through the process. So the um, aim of this tool or the, the function of this tool, the let's say intended purpose of this tool is to help you in creation of a compliant IVD Ready, uh, IVD uh, regulation documentation based on the variety of templates and also component information. So on the one hand, we are providing templates which are built in in the system, helping you uh, framing the whole requirements of the IVDR, not to miss anything here. And on the other hand, we are also connected to um, data or information on components provided by their manufacturers, which also facilitates the information exchange between the two players. Um, we also provide a built-in workflow studio to specify a laboratory workflow, and that helps tremendously in uh, setting up the whole documentation, uh, partially also for huge workflows or pretty, pretty uh, long workflows, uh, which contain a multitude of many different components within the same workflow. The whole thing is uh, also um, containing a, a knowledge base, uh, a whole database and standards. We are also providing some examples throughout the, the workflows themselves. And as I already mentioned, the templates. So it's more or less learning by doing. So if you're using our tool, uh, you can access a lot of additional information, helping text, tool tips, uh, uh, knowledge bases, etc. And that would even help you in uh, probably also gaining knowledge during working on the relevant um, information. Not only that, we also provide uh, so-called wizards. Those are small built-in tools that help you in creating uh, even content. So we are not only providing the framework itself, so the template-based framework, but we also help you in creation of the content itself. Uh, and that's uh, pretty helpful 
because our data model behind uh, really helps you in gaining consistency, um, um, also keeping the consistency and based on certain rules, um, our system can even predict certain aspects, for example, the classification of device and so on. The whole tool is a software as a service, so you do not need to install any software, any modules locally on your system. You can directly access the system via the browser and therefore no installation is required. Of course, um, we're aiming for the highest cybersecurity standards here. Our system is running on a certified ISO 27001 European data center. Of course, the data is uh, treated uh, um, according to the highest standards. And we also do um, actions like regular penetration testing, etc. The tool at the moment is available in English and German. Additional languages are already on our roadmap. Last but not least, uh, the IBD assistant part for the laboratories here is free of charge for laboratories and health institutions which fall under this definition. So to sum up, um, what we are trying to depict here is that we have a certain workflow from A to Z. Uh, typically, you define your intended purpose, you walk through the workflow studio. We have seen that already in the past webinars. By the way, all the webinars are available on our YouTube channels and other channels, also on our website, uh, GSPRs. And today we would like to talk about performance evaluation. How does it work? In general, we have a platform here, and this platform collects on the one hand information from different databases, for example, the knowledge base, the templates database, the different products, and last but not least, also the standards. And it processes via different tools. You do not need to um, care about all of these details here, but we already mentioned that we have something called the Workflow Studio, helping you in setting up the workflows. The wizards helping you in setting up the content and last but not least, uh, a built-in what you see is what you get document editor helping you in creating uh, the documentation, which at the end will help you in proving the um, compliance if you need to show it to, for example, a competent authority. Yeah, so to sum up, where do we stand? Um, that's what already happens during the past year. You see, it a, was a pretty busy year already. Everyone who followed us um, took those steps together with us. So we started in talking about the documentation strategy. Uh, we were guided through the creation of the intended purpose, qualified our devices as IVD, uh, did a proper risk classification according to the NX8 of the IVDR. We worked on the specification on the workflows or even individual devices uh, using the Workflow Studio. And in the last session, we worked together on assessing the GSPRs. By the way, one of the major topics, the general safety and performance requirements, as also Karin already pointed out, they play really a major role in the whole system because uh, compliance with the general safety and performance requirements according to the Annex 1 of the IVDR is a requirement that is already in place since May 2022 for each and every in-house IVD device. Um, yes, and now what is new? Um, yeah, we probably present our new, new module here in this section, our new set of templates, the performance evaluation package uh, in our first version. And um, I would like to show you where we stand right now. Um, we now provide also templates uh, for performance evaluation plan and also for the performance evaluation report. So two key documents which are required to document the compliance with the IVDR. Yeah, and without any further words, I would like to jump into the uh, tool itself. So you should be able now to see my screen here. We have already prepared uh, a workflow over the past uh, few months. Uh, and that workflow is already well known to some of you. We were working on that on a continuous basis. So you can see already some green ticks here. And uh, maybe a few words uh, to again explain how this whole tool works. We have a kind of a guided approach here from top to bottom. First, uh, we were asking uh, about general information on the device or workflow. We were asking several more information to be able to answer or to create our intended purpose statement that was done by using this intended purpose wizard. 
that led us to the proper documentation of the intended purpose. So what you can see here, those are already created documents and these documents have been created more or less automatically by the system based on your given information, completely pre predefined, completely pre-populated. So uh, a lot of help and a lot of automation already given here. Um, we did already the risk classification. I do not want to um, go too much into detail here. And we also walked through the Workflow Studio. And just as a reminder, um, the Workflow Studio is a help helping tool that helps you in setting up your steps and adding components to each of these steps. And uh, the, the relevant uh, information I would like to give you here is that these components uh, come with a whole data model provided by the manufacturer of these components. Uh, of course, everything you see here, I just wanted to remind you one more time here is that this is of course only a demo workflow, not real components, not real workflows, but uh, I think it's sufficient to understand the whole system here. So, and the nice thing here is that the information given by the manufacturers are really pre-processed automatically in the background by our system and are automatically populating into the relevant documents later on. Um, yes, some more questions uh, are then asked on the use environment. This is important because the use environment might have some influence, of course, on the whole setup and has to be considered when it comes to the regulatory requirements, for example, changing main aspects, main parameters of the usage environment that could influence the safety and also performance of your in-house device. So therefore, that also needs to be considered. Just think of humidity, temperature, environmental uh, um, environmental conditions, etc. cetera. Um, so therefore, there's another wizard. And last but not least, um, based on all of this information, we have now uh, released the performance evaluation module. And as you can see here, this first version already provides you with uh, templates for the performance evaluation plan, as well as the performance evaluation report. Let's have a quick look into these documents. I think everyone is curious right now. So as you can see, this template, this performance evaluation plan really provides you with the fully fledged uh, content you typically would expect uh, as being part of the performance evaluation plan from the point of view of the regulation. So on the left side, if you have a look into the tree, you see it can be pretty much at the end, but uh, of course um, you need to consider that some of the uh, Parameters here are, of course, not applicable to you. So just to remind you, probably not everything is applicable to your specific device at the end. The document itself uh, is uh, uh, addressable via this uh, built-in editor. So you can walk through it. You can, of course, edit it wherever you like, similar to a Word or Google Doc or a similar application where you can uh, edit the text and also add stuff and remove stuff as well. And to help you, we always provide uh, these so-called pre-fill blocks. Uh, partially they are already pre-filled and in uh, bright gray, you can identify variables. And this is already part of our whole system. And so as you remember, probably we are working on a data model and all of this gray uh, boxes here, uh, they are representing variables which you only enter once in the whole system and therefore a whole consistency is guaranteed throughout the whole application. Many of these blocks have been already pre-filled. Uh, you can also add address inform additional information via these uh, pop-ups here, via these information icons uh, that always provide you additional information, maybe helping text and so on. And the whole plan, of course, is uh, built up according to the requirements. So first talking about different objectives and milestones, we provide you already with uh, some example texts here and things which you need to consider typically in your performance evaluation. The device description is already more or less a field, especially regarding the purpose. We did it in the past together with our wizard for the intended purpose. Um, talking about limitations, what is the analyte? That is also something that needs to be filled. 
and so on and so forth. We also have a chapter talking about state of the art. We also provide um, text here, which you can use or um, reuse as well. And this uh, document is uh, already pretty pre-filled based on the information you give. Of course, it still contains uh, a lot of free text fields because um, the template we are providing here, it has a very broad approach. It needs to fit to uh, plenty of different types of devices. So therefore still a big degree of freedom for you. But with all of these texts provided here, it can already help uh, a lot in pre-filling all of this information. Okay, back to the oversight here. The overview provides us also the link to the report. The report is the same thing. So um, just to uh, give you a short insight here, on the left side, you again see we are referencing, of course, many things which has, have been mentioned already in the plan. This is uh, clear because everything that had been planned also needs to be represented in the report itself. Again, similar approach. Uh, many things have been pre-filled already, and you can uh, then walk through the document and fill out step by step each and every part which is then needed. If you're fine with one uh, point, you can set it to done for yourself. This helps you also in gaining an uh, overview on how far you are already, but this is just a small helping tool. As usual, you can then also export the document and add to your relevant quality management documentation. Good. Uh, I mean, this is the part uh, which um, is already available in the in the IVD assistance section um, for the general devices. And I would like to go back to, to my presentation again. Because uh, I would also announce uh, another very cool tool we are very proud of, which is uh, also under development and uh, this would be really a game changer in my point of view because this is a module that helps uh, especially NGS laboratories in validating their uh, workflows. So uh, as you can see, our whole platform of course covers many, many aspects. We are working on modules for the manufacturers as well, for their CE devices, but also for providing components on different levels. But of course on the laboratory side, um, we are talking about the um, the tools helping you in creating the IVD uh, R relevant documentation. Uh, but especially when it comes to NGS, we know that uh, procedures and also the validation can be pretty complex, as we have heard uh, before, also in the in the talks of Karin and and Clara. And with this tool, we would like to to help you um, furthermore to even create the data. So therefore we introduced the NGS validation service. This is an extra tool independent of the, of the rest of the application, but of course uh, will be connected to it in the future. And this tool supports the creation execution of the, of the uh, studies, but also the documentation, including the validation plans, doing the data analysis and also creating the reports. And here with this application, we are focusing on germline NGS IH IVDs. So if you're a laboratory, uh, having a germline NGS uh, IH IVDs, this service could be uh, exactly the thing uh, which can help you in validating this. So to sum it up, this is an additional module that is specifically configured for NGS laboratories. It helps you uh, in validating these workflows uh, in accordance with the IVDR, of course, focusing on the analytical performance evaluation. It uh, offers comprehensive support from the validation master plan over the data analysis uh, down to the validation report. Of course, also um, everything is the same uh, technically uh, background. Uh, we also only using uh, our ISO 27001 certified data center for the data upload. And the idea is really significantly save cost and time thanks to uh, plenty of wizards and rule-based document generation. Yeah, how does it look like? Um, just a quick glance also into this tool. Um, I switch to my second presentation here. 
So you can see here, we also have this NGS demo workflow and I would like to validate it right now. And we have exactly three steps. First, we need to validate, uh, or we need to set up a plan for the validation. Secondly, we perform the validation. That means that we are ready. Thank you, Andreas, for demonstrating how Patomic supports labs with the validation of their in-house devices. The performance evaluation templates in, in the IVD Assistant will be available by the 18th of March. As already showcased by Andreas, Platomix has developed the first version of a solution that guides la NGS labs in the planning, execution, and documentation of their validation for the relevant analytical parameters. Our NGS validation service can be used as a standalone product, but can also seamlessly integrate with our IVD Assistant. The NGS validation service will be available as an additional fee-based solution on our platform. Our current product version supports the analysis of validation data from germline whole exome sequencing and covers SNVs and small indels. It currently covers relevant validation parameters such as analytical sensitivity, positive predictive value, and F1 score. Platomics NGS validation service will guide labs towards a successful validation in three steps. First, setting up the validation plan, followed by the analysis of uploaded data from the validation experiments, and lastly, the generation of a validation report as showcased by Andreas. Our new NGS validation service will be available by the 18th of March. If your lab performs next generation sequencing, you can request to our you can request access to our validation service through the QR codes displayed here. We have now reached the end of our agenda for today's webinar. I hope it provided you with valuable insights into what validation means in the context of the IVDR and how Platomics enables labs to tackle the challenges that come along with it. Our next webinar will cover the topic of risk management and which steps lab must take to meet the IVDR requirements and ensure the safety and reliability of their diagnostic tests. It will take place on April the 30th, and you can already register by using the link in the chat window below or by registering on our website. The recording of today's webinar will be available on our website early next week. Thank you for joining us today. Stay tuned for our IVD Ready webinar series and I wish you a pleasant afternoon.